in that case. Stephen, are we good to go? We're good to go, we're live. On. All right, <clears throat> great. Well, hello everybody. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Ladies and gentlemen, your excellencies, friends and colleagues, welcome to the side event, Partnering Through Culture, Heritage for, and Art for Resilient and Inclusive Recovery, held within the context of the UN High Level Political Forum, 2021. My name is Dr. Ege Yildirim, Heritage Planner and member of the International Council on Monuments and Sites, or ECOMOS, of the Our World Heritage Initiative and of the Climate Heritage Network, on behalf of my fellow event coordinators, Stephen Weiber of the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions, or IFLA, and Juliana Strogan, Heritage Manager at the Ryukan Notoden World Heritage Site and member of the sustainability team at Our World Heritage, I have the great pleasure and honor of welcoming you, our speakers and attendees. We look forward to a lively session where we explore the crucial role of culture in its various aspects in, the support, in supporting sustainable development, particularly through the fifth P the, and the transversal 17th global goal of the 2030 agenda, partnerships. As noted in our concept note of the session, culture is now recognized in many international and local circles as the fourth dimension of sustainable development, and it's one that permeates all other aspects of it. Beyond the impacts that the cultural fields um, including heritage and art have in and of themselves, partnerships involving cultural actors can increase the impact of wider policies everywhere from climate action to community cohesion and public health. Thus, culture has a unique ability to support resilience and well-being, and make a major contribution to delivering the SDGs. Meaningful partnerships based on accountability and inclusiveness can lead not only to a more sustainable future for cultural institutions and the sector, but also reinforce their ability to enhance overall resilience and well-being. This session follows on from the high-level event organized by the President of the UN General Assembly on, on the 21st of May, 2021, just recently, and last year's side event um, organized by the Culture 2030 Goal Campaign side event at the HLPF 2020. This time we're focusing on the culture and partnerships connection. We will be exploring this theme through some specific questions that um, our eminent speakers today um, have been um, directed with. Um, how can we use partnerships with the culture sector to accelerate sustainable development in the decade of action? This is to bring together cultural actors in fields of arts, creativity, heritage, and other stakeholders from different stakeholders, and to realize the potential of culture and deliver on wider development goals. And how do we do this? What kind of partnership models can we actually um, implement these through? How can we bring together unique strengths of different players and what lessons can we learn and take away and share with each other? To address these questions, we have gathered a broad range of partners dealing with various aspects of culture today. From elected representatives of local governments to UNESCO national commissions, experts, civil society networks. To give a very brief overview of our stellar list of speakers today, here we have Mr. Tunç Soyar, Mayor of the City of Izmir, Turkey, Dr. Peter Kurz, Mayor of the City of Mannheim, Germany, also President of the Global Parliament of Mayors, Dr. Kyung Koo Han, Secretary General of the Korean National Commission for UNESCO, Mr. Steven Weiber, Policy and Advocacy Manager at IFLA, Mr. Jordi Pasquale, Coordinator of the Agenda 21 for Culture or the Culture Committee of UCLG, the United Cities and Local Governments, Ms. Pamela Jerome, Treasurer General of ECOMOS, Ms. Patricia O'Donnell, President of Our World Heritage Foundation, Mr. Stephen Stenning, Director of Arts and Society at the British Council, Ms. Julianne Polanco, Co-Chair of the Climate Heritage Network, Professor Dr. Doris Summer, Director of the Cultural Agents Initiative at Harvard University, and last but not least, Katie Warren, Research Fellow at the University College of London. Before we move on to our first speaker, just some logistic reminders for everybody. This session is being recorded and live streamed on YouTube and will be available for viewing afterwards. Attendees can post questions in the Q&A box provided and on the YouTube recording, to which we will do our best to fully respond at the end of the session. So moving on to our first speaker, 
it's my great honor to welcome Mayor Tun Soyar. I will give a, a very brief um, bi biographical introduction um, to him. You can find the full descriptions of our biographies in the a link provided here, our World Heritage Sustainability. Um, Mr. Soyar was elected as the mayor of Izmir Metropolitan Municipality in Turkey in his local elections in March 2019. Previously, he had served for two terms as the mayor of the smaller town in Izmir province of Sefiri Hisar, where he actually began the in movements Chita Slow or Slow City, an international network of slow cities in Turkey, which has been growing um, widely in the country now. Um, he um, is also very actively involved in UCLG. He is a um, board member of the Global Executive Committee of Local Governments for Sustainability of ICLE. He's also chairman of the board of the Turkish Association of Social Democrat Municipalities, SODAM. After this introduction, um, I give the floor to Mr. Mayor Soyer. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, dear Ege. Dear participants, I'm honored to address you today. Humanity is looking for a new balance where culture could play unifying role in building the future of our societies. In this context, cities create many opportunities to interactions between individuals and different communities. The history and successful peaceful coexistence of different communities in Izmir shed a light and inspire us today when building our future with culture. Izmir is one of the largest port cities in the Mediterranean with four and a half million inhabitants. It has 8,500 years of history. The city has become the point where Eastern and Western cultures mingle and live together in harmony. Diversity and coexistence have been at the core of Izmir's identity. This is a fortune of our people, and this leads people of Izmir towards prosperity. We understand that passing on our cultural heritage to the future will make our communities more resilient to future challenges. They will be able to recover quickly from difficulties in solidarity. We should seize every opportunity to strengthen the global partnership and collective action on culture. In this respect, we are so happy that Izmir is going to host the UCLG Culture Summit from 9 to 11 September this year. In Culture Summit, we will work together to connect culture and urban resilience. We will exchange and fostering cultural policies on heritage, creativity, diversity, and knowledge, which are key for local sustainable developments. We will promote culture as the fourth pillar of development and a core component of global solidarity. I can say that in Izmir, we will meet, share, dialogue, and try to create together the future we want. Izmir will also host the world's most famous gastronomic fair, Terra Madre, in 2022. With this big event, we will bring the gastronomic heritage of our country into the world's attention. With Terra Madre Anatolia, we will introduce local products, ancestral seeds, and rich cuisine of Anatolia to the world. We sincerely believe that the ancient agricultural production culture will inspire the visitors of Terra Madre. Culture inspires creativity, innovation, solidarity, and cooperation, which are extremely important in our fight against the global pandemics and other crises. However, COVID-19 hit the cultural life of our communities very severely. Libraries, memorials, community centers, museums, and all cultural venues have suffered several months of lockdown. Performances, festivals, parades, and intangible heritage events have been canceled. Workers in these sectors have been left for months without any income. Their contribution 
is important for the well-being of our communities. The active involvement of all in the cultural life of the community is damaged by COVID-19, and so is the welfare and the quality of our democracies. In Izmir, we faced these severe challenges in solidarity with the artists. We hosted several public discussions with artists, academics, and NGO representatives. We have prepared a two-stage action plan to produce solutions in the short term. As the first action, we ensured the continuation of production in digital and mobile platforms. The second action was to establish a support desk in our culture office to keep in touch with the artists and collect their feedback and demands. Together with the artists, we produced creative solutions to increase the amount of cultural activities and arts in the city. We also provided financial support to local artists and creative industries practitioners. I believe that outcomes of these actions will lead to larger policy strategies in the field of culture and sustainable development. Finally, I very much look forward to seeing you this September in Izmir during the UCLG Culture Summit, where we can shape our future together through local actions on culture. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Mayor Soyer, to you. And uh, it's really inspiring to hear how Izmir um, is embracing culture as a tool to, for wider social goals, especially the agricultural heritage, Terra Madre. We're all looking forward to the Culture Summit in September, and hopefully in person if all goes well. Uh, and it's really very valuable for you, for us to um, make the emphasis, the connection with the COVID-19 impact on the cultural sector and the artists, and of course, the links with democracy. So thank you very much for contributing with your voice of local governments um, from Izmir today. Um, and um, now um, I will um, move on um, to um, your peer, um, uh, our honorable uh, mayor from, from another country, a country close to Turkey, Germany, from the city of Mannheim. Uh, Dr. Peter Kurz um, is with us today. Um, so he has been the mayor of Mannheim uh, since 2007 uh, um, and holds various honorary posts in European and international committees. Um, he is representing Germany at the European Committee of the Regions, as well as the Council of European municipalities and regions. He is also active in UCLG, where he's one of five German local representatives in the World Council. Um, and he was one of the founding members of the Global Parliament of Mayors, uh, in which he serves as chair uh, since November 2019. Um, so it's a, an honor to have you here with us, Mayor Kurtz. Uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Well, thank you, Yildirim, and dear Mayor Sawyer, esteemed participants, dear friends, and uh, colleagues, thank you, first of all, for organizing this important event today to talk about partnering through culture, heritage, and art. In order to have an inclusive and sustainable recovery, we need real cooperation between sectors, government at all levels, and civil society. Events like this one give us the opportunity to build these connections and remind us of the importance of culture and in particular arts in everything we do. Mannheim has a rich cultural history and has always focused on the arts. Nearly a hundred years ago, Mannheim was already called the city of work and art. More recently in 2014, Mannheim was named a UNESCO city of music and our city government plays an important role in fostering creativity and promoting the arts by supporting the good ideas of our residents and giving them the platform and resources they need to scale them up. For example, when Mehmet Ungarn, a Mannheim resident with a vision, opened a school for so-called oriental instruments like the Ute and Ney, the city supported his efforts. Mannheim's culture department, which saw the potential in his idea early on, helped expand his oriental music academy, in leading to the establishment of a world music program at Mannheim's Pop Academy, the first institution of higher education in pop music in Germany. 
The, the Oriental Music Academy plays an important role in preserving cultural heritage in our city because 45% of our residents are either immigrants or the children of immigrants, one in five of whom has roots in Turkey. As a result of Mehmet's efforts, city residents now have the opportunity to learn how to play these traditional instruments. But of course, it has a wider scope, um, and it's already mentioned by Mayor Sawyer, to cherish diversity, preserve peace and conviviality. These are central efforts uh, of our city. The Academy also uses music to help integrate young immigrants. Mehmet and his team developed music programs to engage children and make them feel connected to the urban community. Again, we used our resources at City Hall to make these good ideas more broadly accessible. The city of Mannheim also works to create an environment in which arts and culture can flourish and ensure that we build bridges between different sectors. To this end, Next Mannheim, this is the name of our startup ecosystem, has its own cultural innovation office. The office promotes sustainable urban culture projects and actively supports innovation and collaboration between culture, business, technology, and science. Furthermore, Next Mannheim has multiple startup centers with resources for entrepreneurs and thousands of square meters of office space that are specifically dedicated to arts and culture. These centers include the Music Park for the local music industry, as well as C-Hub, a center specifically for the creative industries, which is home to more than 50 startups. City administrations cannot be the main resource of creativity and new ideas, although we try, but we can create environments in which our talented residents can flourish and connect. Mannheim startup ecosystem does exactly this. I'm also speaking, as you mentioned today, as the chair of the Global Parliament of Mayors, an organization that recognizes that culture is an important part of all the work we do as city leaders. Just yesterday, together with the IOM, UNHCR, the British Council and the Mayors Migration Council, the GPM hosted an official side event at the high level political forum on climate related migration. This is a part of a larger project that the GPM is developing on the topic ahead of COP26. From the beginning, culture was included in all the conversations we had about this project and how cities in the global north and south can work together and address climate forced migration. Culture is not a side topic. It is a core part of the work that we do. We are currently in the process of developing a call to action for COP26, again, with culture as a central element. In the coming months, we will invite all of you to sign the call. I hope you join us in our efforts to address this important issue and ensure that local government voices are heard at COP26. Local government has an important role to play in ensuring that culture is a central part of our recovery processes, not an afterthought. We can use our resources and our voice to ensure that the brilliant ideas and creative solutions of our citizens can turn into real action on the ground. Thank you for including me in this conversation. I'm looking forward to a fruitful debate. Thank you so much, Mayor Kurz. Um, and again, um, a brilliant local government leader is verifying what we all knew um, all along, that culture is at the core of development. Um, it's very valuable for us for you to um, bring to the fore the intercultural dialogue um, aspect um, and how this connects to the rising issues of migration related to um, climate um, crises, of course. And the way you also mentioned scaling of resources, how can we take these good examples and scale them and uh, make them wider um, as um, all throughout the world in different cities through peer learning. So thank you for your the examples for us, Mayor Kurtz. Um, and um, now I will uh, move on to our third speaker, um, Dr. Kyung Hoo Han, uh, who is contributing today with a pre-recorded intervention um, as it is very late um, at the moment in South Korea. Um, it's um, time for bed over there. Uh, so he has sent us a video recording, which um, our um, reporter uh, Juliana Strogan will uh, kindly share, I believe. So let's have a look at that.
Is everything okay with the sharing of the video? Yes, it's coming now. Great. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very honored to be a part of this gathering to talk about culture, art, and heritage, and their role and possibilities for our future. There are now just nine years left until 2030, the year by which we committed to achieving the Sustainable Development Goals. Numerous ways to accomplish sustainable development have been suggested and implemented in various areas of society, and the potential of culture has attracted great attention in this, in this respect. Culture is now considered the fourth pillar of sustainable development, and UNESCO has implemented many discussions and activities focused on strengthening the resiliency and sustainability of society through culture. The World Heritage System, one of UNESCO's most well-known and most successful programs, has a great potential by inspiring us with a profound sense of wonder and joy, as well as by facilitating the use of heritage as an important asset for economic development. However, in recent years, conflicts have arisen between states regarding the heritage listing system. To defuse such conflicts and ensure that the World Heritage System remains an effective vehicle, a human-based approach to culture is crucial. For a long time, the general approach to cultural heritage has tended to objectify heritage and consider it as something independent with a fixed innate value. For example, the World Heritage System tends to assume the heritage as a permanent and absolute value in its material form as expressed through the concept of outstanding universal value. However, this approach omits the fact that cultural heritage has always existed through evolving relationships with various cultural groups. To avoid this, we need to focus instead on ensuring that heritage and culture remembered and presented through the perspectives of all the various people that interact with them. The same piece of heritage may represent the proud legacy of a splendid part of a history for some people, while at the same time being seen by others as evidence of a history of disgrace and cruelty. However, the forward voice is often loud and clearer than the letters. To successfully achieve sustainable development and a more inclusive and resilient society, we need to listen to the voices of all people surrounding heritage. In order to ensure the diversity of interpretation in the UNESCO's World Heritage System, we need a structural system alongside international awareness and empathy. Such a system will also help to resolve possible conflicts between states or social groups over culture and heritage. Most of all, this way will correspond to the fundamental purpose and mission of UNESCO and its World Heritage System. In this regard, Korean National Commission has hosted an international conference on UNESCO World Heritage Interpretation annually since 2016. This conference gathers international heritage experts and various other stakeholders to raise international awareness of the concept of heritage interpretation and its significance. Secondly, Korean National Commission is undertaking thematic research on heritage interpretation and presentation, aiming to collect the best practices on how to interpret heritage that has diverse aspects and histories according to different stakeholders. Thirdly, Korean National Commission is currently working on publishing a guidebook on World Heritage Interpretation, which will be completed in 2022. This guidebook will suggest some guiding principles for heritage interpretation. One reason why culture is regarded as a significant facilitator of sustainable development is that its approaches and methodologies are effective to engage minorities and have the power to generate democratic social structures 
and reduce discrimination. It takes this power of cultural heritage interpretation to amplify alienated voices and engage a wide spectrum of stakeholders that we need to harness to construct a more peaceful, sustainable, and inclusive society. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you to Secretary General um, Han uh, for his intervention. Um, I do admit um, I forgot to introduce him um, as per standard procedure, which I will do so now. Um, Dr. Han, um, in his very thoughtful intervention, you may feel it, he is a cultural anthropologist. I think um, there's a lot of professional insights that we're um, leaning on in learning about um, the connection of heritage and um, uh, how um, it can actually be um, a source of conflict. It's a medium to actually um, bring to the surface um, the hu human nature, the, the conflicts and how to actually re reconcile them through um, approaches of uh, more inclusive world heritage interpretation. UNESCO Korea is working uh, very actively on these topics indeed. Um, and it, it's really um, a very good case study, let's say, of the connection of culture and peace and inclusive societies. So thank you to him. Um, Dr. Han, um, uh, is um, a professor at the College of Liberal Studies at Seoul National University. Um, he has uh, served um, as member of the Korean National Commission for UNESCO, the Pl Planning Pol Policy Committee of the Korea Federation for the Environmental Movement, the Presidential Commission for Sustainable Development. He was the president of the Korean International Migration Studies Association, the Korean Society for Education for International Understanding, and some more um, uh, NGOs that um, I will not take time now, but he has been a very active civil society leader um, in Korea and um, in South Korea, as we can see. So um, very pleased to have him with us today. And uh, now um, uh, we can move on uh, to our next speaker, um, our very own Mr. Stephen Weiber, um, who is a policy and advocacy manager at the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions, IFLA, where he works to help strengthen advocacy across the library field at all levels. He is particularly focused on the UN Sustainable Development Goals and oversees work on copyright, heritage, internet governance, and human rights. Uh, please, Stephen, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Ege, for the floor. And thank you very much, Mayor Sawyer and Mayor Kurtz, for your words so far. So as Ege said, I'm Stephen Weiber from the International Federation of Library Association. We are the global organization for libraries. And obviously, an important focus for me in my work is to talk about all that libraries can achieve on their own, the unique strengths of libraries and what we can do. And clearly this is, it's a huge network. We're talking about millions of institutions around the world. If we only think about public libraries, for the countries for which we have data, there is on average one public library for every 16,000 people. So we've got a very intense, a very dense network of cultural institutions, a cultural infrastructure that we can call on. But the problem is that they can't do everything. We know very well we can't do everything. And it's incredibly stressful for our members when they're expected to do everything because we're just setting ourselves up for a fall. And this is why partnerships and the topic of this session today is so vital because partnerships unlock things. Partnerships allow us to bring together the strengths that libraries have as cultural institutions, drawing on their strengths, the culture they hold, the culture they give access to, the culture they promote, and they can combine it with other actors. And so, for example, to talk about some of these unique strengths, one of the issues that we're looking to talk about today, there is the importance of culture as an, a gateway drug. And it's a slightly strange term to use, I'm aware, but the fact through a library, that through libraries, through other cultural centers, you're attracting people in with a different mindset. They're not thinking about they have a problem with the law, so they're going to the police station. They have a problem with health, so they're going to the hospital. They're going there with a more open mind, asking questions, more open to do things. And this can be a great way of actually starting different conversations, making different connections, offering different services. And so we see libraries providing this for way of helping people access health information without the stigma of going to the doctor, helping people access legal information without the stigma of going to legal support. And it works in so many ways. Similarly, the fact that it's a cultural space makes it feel less official. It feels more like somewhere where everyone can come together, 
around shared reference points. Those shared reference points are so important for social cohesion, for social capital. And so again, you have this space where because it's that cultural space, you can start to have those democratic discussions. You can draw on the fact that there is this wealth of resource, of information, of culture, of history available. And we see great examples of libraries pushing things. Right now in Chile, the library and the digital library as well, this doesn't need to be physical, is producing a fantastic collection of materials around the new constitutional convention that's taking place, informing the debate, using the fact that it's not seen as political, it's seen as cultural. And so you can have these great partnerships between libraries and other actors in the health sector, in the legal sector, in the political sector, in order to achieve goals such as SDG3, better call, uh, health, good health and well-being. SDG 16, political participation, engagement in discussion. Of course, at the same time, libraries, they're not doing, I don't know, libraries themselves, they have their staff. There are committed, dedicated professional staff who are well trained in helping people to find the information that will help them achieve their goals. But what can really bring a library to life is the partnership with other actors in the community. Sometimes these are official actors, so the teachers with schools, so that you can help coordinate the children who may be doing less well at school and then come to the library. We know already hugely that children who struggle at home have fewer resources at home, make more use of the library in order to support their literacy, to support their access to literature, to support their education. But it's also the case with other cultural actors. There are so many great ideas and we've been looking into these in the context of the International Year of Creative Economy and Sustainable Development of artists coming to libraries, of using that space to provide something, to stimulate, as Mayor Sawyer said, to use culture, to stimulate creativity in a way that libraries on their own couldn't do. Similarly, there are so many ways we can work with other providers to provide skills, to provide new possibilities, new ways to actually learn, to retrain, to rediscover possibilities, to work, to learn, to earn, to fulfill your own development, your own potential. So, I think coming back and simply to underline the, the, the title and the theme of this session as a whole, there is such a huge possibility both to involve libraries and other cultural institutions, to involve them from the start, when you're beginning to think about a policy about how you're going to improve well-being, how you're going to improve employability, how you're going to promote democratic participation, to go out and talk to those cultural actors, ask what how can you help? What can you add? How can we design our policies, our strategies in a way that brings you in from the beginning, that realizes the potential of these partnerships? And secondly, make sure that cultural institutions are enabled to, through their statute, through their practices, through their funding, to form their own partnerships, to draw on the strength of the entire community in order to really bring them to life. So with that, I'll hand back to you, Ege. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Stephen, for these great insights and inspiration. And also thank you for connecting us with a, a couple of the SDGs at hand. Actually, we can do that exercise with all SDGs, but uh, you pointed out some important ones like SDG 3. Um, and uh, it's really important to have libraries as a resource, a comfortable space to come together. And especially in this age of information overload, um, a, a medium of information reliability goes through libraries as well. So. Thank you very much for your contributions. Um, so we're moving on to our next speaker, uh, Mr. Jordi Pasquale. Uh, Jordi is the coordinator of the Committee on Culture um, of the World Organization of United Cities and Local Governments, UCLG. Uh, the work of the committee is based on the Culture 21 Actions, the most complete toolkit on culture and sustainable cities. UCLG has a range of learning programs on capacity building and connectivity of cities. Um, and Jordi is also involved in the global campaign Culture 2030 Goal, of which ECOMOS and IFLA are also part of. So we work together very closely with uh, Jordi's um, inspiring um, uh, leadership, let's say. Um, the, the campaign advocates for the role of cultural factors and actors in the UN Agenda 2030. Jordi is also a member of the jury of the European Capital of Culture and teaches cultural rights and globalization at the Open University of Catalonia. So Jordi, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ege. Very complete uh, explanation. Let me precise that I was member of the jury of the European Capital of Culture. I am not anymore. All the rest uh, was right. more, than, more, more than correct. 
Thank you very much. I feel honored to, 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 to say a few things on behalf of UCLG, the World Organization of Cities, the Cultural Committee of UCLG. Let me uh, express my gratitude, our gratitude to our two leaders present here today, Mayor Sawyer, Mayor Kurtz, great speeches. We feel very well represented by all what you said. I will focus my presentation in the Culture 2030 goal campaign. Th this event is already an evidence that multi-actor, multi-sector partnerships are not only feasible, but uh, also uh, needed. L let me begin with the most important partnership we can imagine today, science. Science saving millions of lives uh, after the, during the COVID-19 uh, crisis. Uh, science making us uh, understand that our models of development are uh, not allowing Mother Earth to survive. So very important that we rely first and foremost in this uh, uh, age that we are living of uncertainty at, and also of uh, fake news and lies. Uh, let's trust in science. And what does the Global Sustainable Development Report say in 2019, signed by the, Inde the Independent Group of Scientists? 2019, the document is the evaluation of the evaluations, the evaluation of all the evaluations sent, sent by the uh, member, states, mem member, uh, member states of the United Nations on the progress of the Sustainable Development Goals. The name of this report, it says, the future is now science for achieving the SDGs. The report says there are seven elements, seven elements that have not been recognized as they deserve in the SDGs. Yes, one of these elements is culture. The report says it has not, culture has not received sufficient attention as an intrinsic component in sustainable development and must be translated and integrated in local and national development. The campaign Culture 2015 Goal and uh, the successor Culture 2030 Goal fully endorsed this uh, statement, this principle. We struggled for a culture goal in 2013 because of many reasons that was not achieved. We synthesized our feelings in September 2015 the same day the SDGs were approved, we published a document whose title is Culture in the SDGs, Progress Made, but Important Steps Remain Ahead. We celebrate progress. There is great progress. 11-4, yes, 4-7, uh, 8-3, 16-10, many other, but still cultural actors are not recognized as such as actors uh, taking full seats, full sitting at the table of, of, of development. Um, in 2019, we published a very interesting report. I strongly recommend you to have a look at that report that summarized uh, how the voluntary national reviews were considering culture. Uh, last year, 2020, we uh, published uh, a statement on the important role that culture needs to play in the recovery of the post-COVID-19 uh, societies. And very few weeks ago, we published our mission document, uh, which commits ourselves and invites actors, cultural actors, not only cultural actors, but any uh, group related to the sustainable development uh, to, to embrace our vision the recognition of culture as the, as the fourth pillar of sustainable development, our goals that include certainly a stronger place for the current agenda, the Agenda 2030, but it anticipates that uh, it would be very wise, very suitable that uh, the international community adopts culture as a distinct goal in the post-2030 development agenda. Um, there is a goal on education and uh, all education actors can work 
with the 16 other goals uh, together with the goal on education. There is a goal on uh, gender equity and the feminist movement and the equity movement can work in the 16 other goals as well as in the uh, in, in, in goal uh, five. This is what we believe. We, uh, of course, uh, with a distinct goal, we would be able equally to work with all other um, uh, goals in the post-2030. Well, the goal does not exist for the time being. And this is why we are, say, somehow invited, forced to build more partnerships, uh, as many partnerships as possible. Um, we have to build uh, partnerships with environmentalists, with education, with economic growth, with urban planning, because otherwise we will be have we will be having difficulties in uh, in the next in the next uh, years. Uh, two final uh, final references. First one, we will discuss about all these issues in the uh, UCLG Culture Summit in Izmir. September from the 9th to the 11th of September in Izmir. And final statement, I just uh, read a question uh, raised by uh, a participant in a virtual participant on uh, the way that partnerships can be uh, multiplied. Uh, my answer, our answer would be uh, to localize as much as possible all the efforts for sustainable development. Because when you are working at a local level with citizens in neighborhoods, the barriers, the frontiers between, between what is a cultural actor and an environmentalist actor uh, and an equity actor, sometimes they are melting. We are, we are multidimensional. We, are, we can be committed to many, many, many endeavors at a local level and uh, the place makes sense. Uh, Thank you, Jordi. I will continue the responses later. I had to cut you off, sorry, because of the time constraint, but uh, thank you for uh, setting the scene for our responses. Um, and uh, it's great that you mentioned the science report, um, uh, recognizing the absence of culture and the need for it and um, how we need partnerships. They need us, we need them. Us, and us and them become blurred lines and we are all in, in it together. So thank you for your remarks. And uh, uh, so please do check out the Culture 2030 Goal uh, website and documents and um, sign our statement and uh, declaration and um, have a look at the resources. Thank you so much. Um, moving on to our next speaker, um, we have Ms. Pamela Giro, uh, who is the uh, Treasurer General of the International Council on Monuments and Sites, ECOMOS, with us today. Uh, she's the president of Architectural Preservation Studio, DPC, a New York City-based architecture and preservation firm. Uh, she also served on the board of the U.S. ECOMOS, um, the USA National Committee of ECOMOS. She has been active in uh, various scientific committees of ECOMOS, such as the one for earthen architecture, for 20th century heritage and vernacular heritage. Um, she's been serving on the international board since 2014, and she has consulted on cultural property conservation in the U.S., the Mediterranean Basin, the Black Sea, Middle East, and Far East. So a very, very well-traveled, um, seasoned heritage professional. Um, wonderful to have you with us, Pamela. Um, Pamela please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Aige. Uh, if you don't mind, can uh, you please put on the slides? Thank you. Full screen. Um, I'm going to speak to you today about what partnership models are possible, how can unique strengths be combined, and what lessons can be shared. ECOMOS is an organization that has established partnerships with various actors that help protect heritage sites around the world. For almost 50 years, ECOMOS has been a partner to UNESCO for the World Heritage Convention. Next slide, please which has safeguarded more than a thousand cultural and natural heritage sites of outstanding universal value. However, we also recognize that strategic partnerships with other actors are important to harness the potential of heritage processes to foster sustainability oriented policies and practices. Heritage sites and their complexity and their benefits to multiple stakeholders are important meet media for the establishment of international development standards and approaches that are human rights-based, diversity-conscious, 
environmentally respectful, and sustainable. Adoption and implementation of these standards can be achieved through participatory processes, capacity building, awareness raising, and education. However, not all existing heritage regulations and processes have yet aligned to sustainable development principles. In many cases, human technological and financial right resources are still insufficient or lacking for international intersectoral and integration generational partnerships aimed at the development and implementation of sus sustainability oriented heritage practices, education and capacity building. Next slide. As part of our advocacy in ECOMOS to promote the role of heritage in the agenda 2030, the ECMOS SDGs Working Group published the document entitled Heritage and Sustainable Development Goals, Policy Guidance for Heritage and Development Actors, which is a starting point to engage with various facets of the SDGs during the decade of action. And it explains how heritage is integrated in the implementation of global goals. The document highlights the importance of partnerships at all levels between actors within and outside of heritage sectors, including those with competing interests in heritage protection. It also advocates for collaborating with relevant stakeholders for sustainability oriented heritage practices, which need to be done at the local, national, regional, and global levels. Interdisciplinary, intergenerational, and intersectoral collaborations should be done through effective communication, allocation of resources, development and implementation of adequate regulatory frameworks. Next slide. With COVID-19 now part of the lives of people across and around the world, within the and around heritage sites, ECOMOS believes that this is an opportunity to examine our pr current practices in managing sites, protecting heritage, around the globe. Some sites are more innovative and resilient than others, and we should learn from these good cases, case studies. For example, the communities at the tourist town of Sagada in the Philippines started to create strategies to reduce their reliance on mass tourism. The main draw of the town, they are shifting back to more agricultural-based economy that permits communities to become part of the essential services of food production for major cities in Metro Manila. The town partnered with heritage practitioners that are familiar with logistical arrangements and marketing of products coming from rural areas. Intangible heritage is also evolving during the pandemic and communities are finding ways to showcase their practices through the digital world. Engagement with community members are now happening with Zoom or other similar video conferencing interfaces. Webinars have gained in importance as a tool of communication and capacity building. Next slide. Steps moving forward this year, ECOMOS has also embarked with new partnerships to strengthen the role of culture and heritage to the implementation of UN Agenda 2030. In April, ECOMOS signed an MOU with Global Heritage Fund to strengthen technical assistance and awareness of the important links of heritage as a driver of SDGs in Global Heritage Fund projects. ECOMOS is also working with another partnership agreement with the United Cities and local governments to identify potential action that can be support mayors and government officials for training and capacity building to deal with urban heritage concerns. We hope to give you more updates on these collaborations during the next HLPF in 2022. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pamela, um, for uh, giving us some examples of implementation tools, especially during the current COVID crisis, both with tangible and intangible heritage and less reliance on tourism. There are so many different tools um, that we can learn about and how partnerships through our MOUs at ECOMOS uh, with the Global Heritage Fund is especially one to look out for. Thank you for sharing these insights. Um, the next uh, speaker we have to, uh, with us today is uh, Ms. Uh, Patricia O'Donnell. Um, 
She is the president of the board of the Our World Heritage Foundation, which was constituted in context of the OWH initiative, a civil society movement seeking to renew the spirit of the World Heritage Convention. She found, founded Heritage Landscapes LLC in 1987. She has also contributed to ASLA, ICOMOS, IFLA, Our World Heritage, UNESCO World Heritage, um, and other uh, organizations to advance the valued landscape, cultural, and natural heritage of diverse places and peoples in the USA and around the globe. Welcome, Patricia. The floor is yours. You're muted. Can you unmute? Just unmuted. There we go. Thank you, Ege. Um, our World Heritage is very pleased to be a part of this panel. We are kind of an upstart, having really um, evolved only in about the past year during the COVID pandemic. So we have uh, taken a, a digital platform forward and our um, logo essentially is citizens advancing protection of the earth's treasures. We're particularly focused on the World Heritage Convention Article 5, which states that to ensure effective and active measures are taken, we wish to give the cultural and natural heritage a function in the life of community and integrate protection into comprehensive planning programs. That's a quote from the uh, 1972 convention reaching its 50th anniversary next year. Um, we have been shaping a platform for collaboration and interaction. You could say the whole of it is a partnership. Uh, with volunteers giving their time, um, intellectual capacity, collaborative spirit to the cause of heritage. The 2021 approach is a year of debates on pressing topics so far has brought teams together for the themes on information technology, tourism, genders and diversities, human rights, disasters and pandemics, new heritage approaches. Through the first six months, engaging 700 speakers, 4,000 Zoom participants, and 10,000 YouTube viewers. Our global outreach team is working in 12 languages to break down the language barrier. And in July, we are uh, on the sustainability theme, employing world heritage as a medium for local empowerment towards just and resilient societies and we would say sustainable culture is at the heart of planet, people, prosperity, and peace for all life to thrive and sustain heritage. So the point of OWH is really reaching civil society. We believe that we can, as a larger global community, more effectively work together toward multidimensional Multi, in a multi-dimensional, multicultural world towards safeguarding heritage. Um, both natural and cultural heritage at its root is local, diverse, shared, and inclusive. Local actions for heritage can be supported by shared knowledge gained through OWH. Our platform is really about co-learning to deepen and broaden engagement to advance protection civil society of communities are those that care about heritage and they can connect through OWH. We uh, add an independent voice to the complex matrix of heritage protection. So speaking directly to the questions you posed, OWH, how can uh, partnerships with the cultural sector accelerate sustainable development in the decade of action? As an independent foundation, we're convening, collaborating, and giving voice to natural and cultural heritage through people at local and global levels for co-learning and collaboration and more. And we think that in terms of partnership models, OWH envisions informal collaborations and a range of cooperation on relevant issues. Um, we are young and, uh, evolving and uh, we think that that's a good thing. 
uh, this combining of strengths because we move fast, we can grow as a partner and, and pivot and change directions and address points as needed. Uh, what lessons can be shared? Uh, OWH is a digital platform. We intend to remain a digital platform because it breaks the barriers of global connectivity. OWH Global Outreach on social media is gaining ground on the separation that's created by languages. Um, and we very much appreciate the mostly um, emerging professionals who've been working on our global outreach team. And OWH will remain flexible toward moving forward as challenges and opportunities arise. Thanks for the opportunity to speak. Great, thank you so much, Patricia. Um, indeed, um, OWH is young and dynamic and evolving, and it's, it's very interesting to uh, watch it evolve uh, these days. It's really a great example of harnessing digital technology in our day and age, and also crowdsourcing. Um, it's also a day, uh, an age of crowdsourcing and individuals networking coming together in flexible ways. Uh, so it's a very um, promising and um, I recommend everybody to check out our monthly program of sustainability at OWH that Patricia mentioned. Thank you very much. Um, moving on to our next speaker, we have Mr. Stephen Stenning, um, who leads the British Council's art and society work a cross-disciplinary portfolio using creative cultural approaches to meet global challenges. He developed a global program, including setting up the UK's 30 million pound cultural protection fund, a partnership with the UK government department of digital, cultural, culture, media, and sport. He has a track record of running and programming successful arts organizations. His previous work includes um, being a published playwright in London and a theater pr practitioner. And among his many roles, um, he was also um, on the board of the festivals of Edinburgh. Uh, thank you, Stephen, for joining us, um, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Edgar. I didn't know all of that about myself. Um, and thank you also for all of those participating and involved in setting this up. It's both a joy and an honour to be part of the panel and a delight to be both in the glens of Scotland and virtually in New York at the same time. Um, the power of culture and how we use partnerships to do, deliver wider development is a subject really dear to me. Others have spoken really well and eloquently about um, what culture is and the power of it. And I, I, I want to focus on what has come up um, around the how um, of culture, the how of working through culture. Um, so I'm here from the British Council. We're the UK's uh, cultural relations organization. I don't think that as a, as a title or a designation that means much, but I do think that in building back and creating new and dynamic relationships in search of sustainable, inclusive, imaginative responses to, to global challenges, dynamic cultural relations are vital. Cultural relations is, I think, all about creating deep, trusted and trusting relationships and the importance of diverse partnerships focused on mutual endeavor, willingness to start with a bank blank page and co-create from the ground up. I'll highlight more of partnerships later, but I wanna first pick on the sort of culture of cultural relations and, and culture's contribution to the sustainable development goals, which coincidentally is the subtitle of a report we produced last year called The Missing Pillar, which I would thoroughly recommend. And it looks at the wider contribution um, that, that culture makes to the SDGs, not just um, where there are specific targets, and Geordie has already mentioned 11.4. The first line of that states, culture shapes the way we understand our lives and the meaning we give to it. And it lies therefore at the basis of any notion of people-centered development. And I think it is that people-centered development, the how of our work, um, that that has influenced us. We, we've seen the need to explore more people-centered approaches and more deliberately align our work with the SDGs through thematic programming that, um, uh, that where the de delivery is focused around identified global challenges, but also through focusing our research evaluation and the sharing of learning and through policy engagement. Recommendations from that missing pillar report were to increase access 
and understanding of the SDGs to improve evidence of impact and advocate for the role of arts and culture. And we do this through uh, Missing Pillar Talks in partnership with UNESCO UK um, and UCLG. And we're aiming to hold a global event early next year to celebrate artistic in it, um, initiatives that contribute to SDGs and bring different actors together. Cultural heritage is a particular powerful lens. When the starting point is interest in what others value, I think there is a special energy in, to partnerships and relationships that follow. So as mentioned, we um, started the UK's Cultural Protection Fund back in 2016 with, um, in partnership with a government department, but also with partnerships um, in a number of other ways, providing the expertise that British Council didn't have and the connections um, to communities in participating countries. Because from the first, the, the fund was not merely about protecting cultural heritage at risk because of conflict, but it was about nurturing heritage in ways which contribute directly to social cohesion and economic sustainability. The how was always important. And it's involved as a model that promotes extraordinary and diverse partnerships, with, in some cases with community organizations in Iraq, Palestine, Yemen, working with academic institutions, international heritage organizations, commercial companies, in one case, an opera company, um, community groups and, um, and, and artists, um, collectives working on intangible heritage. Always, and necessarily a partner in the country, often UK involvement, sometimes not. The learning through this has been that through the different models, new ways of working have emerged. Virtual reality demonstrating different ways of engaging young people through, through gaming, new models of tourism, and I don't mean solely virtual and digital ones, but sustainable community-based tourism that encourage um, economic, inclusive economies. Um, finally, I want to just um, go on to uh, our climate connection program and bringing people around the world together to meet the challenges of climate change through arts, culture, education, and the English language. We're partnering with the global parliament mayors to raise awareness of the role of cities and leaders in affecting change for people across the planet. And, and um, Mayor Peter Kutz has al already spoken of that. We've also just awarded 17 creative commissions to a range of partners from the UK uh, and, and 28 countries to explore climate change through art, science, digital technology, and all are very diverse and fabulous examples of the power of bringing together cultural actors and different stakeholders from a variety of fields to realize the potential of culture, arts, and heritage. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen, um, <clears throat> for showcasing another um, of the hows, how to do these um, things, how to set up models. And the British Council seems to have a very solid model already. Um, also interesting how you emphasized uh, finding ex expertise that you don't have yourself in partners and complementing each other with different expertise. I think this is a lesson for all of us. Um, and uh, the missing pillar um, is a, a seminal document. We've shared it in, in the chat box, the link. And uh, thank you for reminding us of the climate connection as well. Um, so we are moving on uh, fast toward the end of our speakers list slowly. Um, we have uh, three more speakers left, actually. It's a very packed um, list today. Uh, we have uh, Miss Julianne Polanco. Um, who is uh, the co-chair of the Climate Heritage Network. Um, she's a heritage professional uh, with more than two decades of experience. Her extensive work in the natural resources, environmental land conservation arenas has been on behalf of a member of Congress, California governors, nonprofit organizations, and the private sector. She's currently the California State Historic Preservation Officer. So she's the woman in charge of the whole state's heritage. So she's an important woman. <laughs> Uh, she's a founding member, as we said, co-chair of the CHN, a, vo a voluntary membership organization which aims to amplify cultural dimensions in climate action and promote synergies for greater long-term ambition. Uh, welcome, and uh, the floor is yours, dear Julie. 
Thank you so much. And thank you for having me, uh, esteemed colleagues and, um, and friends. Uh, I've come to you today from Marin County, California and respectfully acknowledge that this is the traditional home of the Coast Miwok people, many of whom today are tribal citizens of the Federated Indians of the Great and Rancheria. Um, as Ige mentioned, I, am, uh, I have the great fortune of being one of the co-chairs of the Climate Heritage Network Partnerships are so critical as we've heard from others today um, from Mayor Kurtz describing nature and culture in that intersection um, to the mayor to Mayor Sawyer talking about food, um, history, culture and social cohesion and um, others, especially in, uh, including Jordi who, who talked about um, making sure that we receive sufficient attention for culture and climate action. Um, the, the network was uh, incubated in, at the Global Climate Action Summit in 2018, uh, this network of arts, culture, heritage organizations to aid communities in achieving goals of the Paris Agreement. We are now uh, more than 200 members strong um, with an international uh, steering committee of, uh, that meets all of the five continents. Um, how are we putting these partnerships and these relationships into action um, we, we are currently working on what we call the Madrid to Glasgow Action Plan. It was incubated in uh, Madrid in at, at COP25. Um, these are seven working groups comprising of 75 to 80 of our membership that are looking at toolkits uh, in this intersection of culture and climate action from the cultural heritage case of valuing traditional cultural knowledge as climate technology, to building reuse in uh, climate action, so carbon calculator work, um, to elevating culture and heritage and voices at COP. We are looking at a, a systematic assessment of inclusion of culture and heritage in climate policy. So a, a look at uh, globally at climate action policies and where culture is included um, and where that can be uh, more strengthened. Um, and then also the role of culture and climate resiliency in development strategies. Um, these working groups are planning to have both um, presentations at COP26, as well as in October, a Culture by Climate Week, similar to one that happened last year where we had over 20 events that, um, that emphasized both uh, examples of things that people are doing to connect their communities to the global climate action efforts that are happening around the world. Um, I just want to also say that there are many opportunities for participation um, and the membership is strong and we invite you all to join us in ensuring that culture has a seat at the table and plays an active role in resilient communities in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you, Julie. Um, thank you for being very concise and using your time uh, very smartly too. Um, uh, we, um, are, uh, we need to learn from the examples of uh, your acknowledging the First Nations um, in, in the state um, and the um, Climate Heritage Network is indeed an impressive and also fast growing network. Um, uh, and also your emphasis on looking at policies um, connecting climate um, and cultural heritage and arts is important. And um, actually COP26 is um, uh, happening in November. And um, I'm glad that in our session, we have now mentioned it and uh, people should perhaps check their calendars to see if they can get engaged in COP26. If you do want to do it, please contact CHN. You know where to look now. Thank you very much. Um, our next speaker is uh, Professor Dr. Doris Summer, um, another lady hailing from the US. Um, she's the director of Cultural Agents, an initiative founded within the um, context of Harvard University. She, um, Doris is professor of Romance Languages and Literatures and of African and African American Studies. Her academic and outreach work promotes development through arts and humanities, specifically through pretexts. Um, pretext is an art based training program for teachers of literacy, critical thinking, and citizenship. Among her books are Foundational Fictions, The National Romances of Latin America, about novels that help to consolidate new republics, proceed with caution when engaged with minority literature on a rhetoric of particularism. And she has many other publications as well, um, but I won't go on too long now and give the floor to dear Doris. Uh, welcome and uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'm delighted to be here and also delighted to be um, late on your agenda because so many of the important issues have, uh, have been raised. And I, uh, I would like to see if um, the work that cultural agents does uh, can 
help to ground and connect some of these very important issues. Uh, we understand with many of you, uh, most recently with um, Stephen Stenning, that the sustainability of heritage um, has to do with using heritage in creative ways, uh, with activating sites, with making um, economic opportunities, artistic opportunities. So here's where arts activate our resources. Um, the human condition, and uh, Ege has heard me say this, the human condition is dynamic. Um, we need to keep that in, um, in focus as we think about developing cities, uh, as we think about violence prevention and also uh, basic education for new generations of citizens. If we can activate that dynamism, that creativity as energy to uh, sustain our heritage, uh, we'll be in a good condition to participate in uh, many of the SDGs. Uh, the SDGs, as many of us have seen, are all connected one with the other. It's impossible to think about potable water if we don't think about gender equity and um, uh, climate, um, et cetera. So what, uh, what I want to say is that activating uh, culture, activating heritage through the arts uh, allows people to take an active part to consider that the heritage is owned by them. Uh, because they can um, interpret it. One of the great advantages of using art uh, and interpreting is that it, um, it inspires people to talk to one another, to reflect, to ask questions, to make things up. And sociability, talking to one another, is the sustaining dynamic of democracies and of, uh, of future-looking projects. Um, Ege and several of our friends here know that we've just launched uh, one of the cultural agents um, initiatives is um, a launch of uh, Renaissance Now. And I, um, I had that on my screen, but Renaissance Now is very much in the spirit of what we're talking about here, uh, encouraging people to make partnerships. The, um, the spirit of the Renaissance combines both, um, let's see, it, it combines audacity with humility. And um, I think that that's the combination that we're looking at here. Uh, when we talk about partnerships, we know that we need one another. So uh, in Renaissance Now, you'll see uh, the, the recording of the launch project very soon, uh, and two of the sequels will be a journal called Cases for Culture, because the in interventions that we make through cultural work and through arts uh, interventions in particular need to have measurable outcomes. We need to measure them. Uh, the other um, element that we need uh, to develop in, um, in Renaissance Now is very close to um, what we just heard um, about uh, from um, uh, Pamela, I believe, training uh, administrators to understand the importance of the arts as vehicles for addressing all of the SDGs. One of our speakers last week was Sam Waba, uh, who reminded us from, uh, from his position in the uh, World Bank that um, arts are not additional activities for administrators. They are the best vehicles to achieve uh, all of their um, goals. So we need to reframe, I think, culture and the arts, uh, not as something uh, different from um, climate change or uh, education or violence prevention, but the best way to achieve those goals. And here is pretext. I have uh, the great pleasure and honor of uh, having just done a pretext training in the public library in Mannheim. I'm so happy to be with uh, Stephen here who represents uh, libraries worldwide. I, uh, I hope we can form a partnership. Mannheim is a model city, I think, for all of the issues we're talking about. Given the leadership of Mayor Kurtz, given the measurable uh, effects of um, the arts interventions there 
And uh, I'm so proud, as I say, to join those efforts through the library. What we do is train uh, librarians and docents in general, teachers in general, to use reading material as raw material to make art. Everyone who reads, reads creatively. There's no way to read without coming with our own cultural baggage. And when we read creatively and make things, art forms, theater, masks, music, uh, any art form we can think of, uh, recipes, we appreciate the difference that's created in the workshop. And to appreciate difference rather than to overcome difference is the, uh, the best way to understand citizenship. So uh, this holistic gear system is, I think, a way to think about our general uh, approach to um, engaging partnerships. We need to be, as I say, audacious and humble. I don't know how to do many things, but I know they need to be done. So I want to link on with all of you, uh, maybe starting with the libraries, because if we can teach children to read uh, critically, creatively, interpret, want to talk to one another, we have the human capital to think of a good future. Thanks so much. Thank you, Doris. Um, it's wonderful to have you with us. And thank you for ending on the note of human capital. I think that should be one of our keywords. And um, also, um, I think you're one of those people who can balance audacity and humility together. And um, I'm very happy to be working with the Renaissance now as well. Um, many of us who are here today are actually connected. We are part of the same community, Mannheim and Doris and cultural agents and culture 2030. Um, so we're trying to get better and better interconnected, but I think we would like to get more connected with non-cultural actors and uh, Doris and others have provided ways to do that for us today. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so we are moving on to our final speaker, um, Katie Warren, <clears throat> who is a research fellow in social science at University College London where she works with Dr. Daisy Fancourt. Daisy was our panelist last year, presenting the World Health Organization's Arts and Health Report in our um, HLPF 2020 side event. And that's how we uh, got to reach Katie uh, through our networking. Uh, she uh, and her team researched effects of social cultural community engagement on health as part of the March network. Um, she's also exploring whether online dance classes can support the mental well-being of young people. Uh, also uh, the UCL COVID-19 social study she's part of. Uh, she's also involved in the Royal College of Music and Imperial College London investigating the benefits of singing for those affected by cancer. Uh, she's a consultant to the World Health Organization and a trustee for Arts, Culture, Health and Wellbeing Scotland. Uh, thank you for being with us Katie. Um, the floor is yours. Thanks. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here today and thank you for that introduction. Um, so as you just heard, um, I work with Dr. Daisy Fancourt and her team. Um, I will be drawing again today on the World Health Organization report, but I'll also be talking a little bit about policy recommendations and highlighting the importance of the work that we're doing at, at University College of London to um, meet some of these policy recommendations through partnerships. So our team at UCL um, worked with the World Health Organization on this report published in 2019, exploring the evidence of the role of the arts in improving health and well-being. Now, through, through reviewing literature in this area, the report brings together over 900 reviews and papers, totaling over 3,000 studies, as you can see on the top line of the screen here. It shows how the arts can support with the prevention, promotion, management, and treatment of a range of different health conditions. So for example, this includes the arts affecting social determinants of health, such as enhancing social bonding and social cohesion, and the arts can support with things like managing, managing mental illness, reducing distress, depression, and anxiety. And that's just to give a few examples. But since the WHO report's publication, the ways in which people have been engaging with the arts and who has been engaging has been affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. So we're exploring these potential changes through our COVID-19 social study. This is a panel study of the psychological and social experiences of adults in the UK, including over 70,000 participants. So during the UK lockdown last year, we found that one in five people increased their arts engagement. We also found that some groups started to engage more than usual, such as people with mental health conditions. And this was interesting because those with these conditions have historically faced more barriers to participation. We also found that there were no ethnic differences. 
And this suggests a potential changing social gradient in arts engagement because people from white ethnic backgrounds typically have a higher engagement rate um, in the arts, such as in pre-pandemic times. We also found that creative hobbies were associated with increases in life satisfaction and decreases in depression and anxiety. So now what this suggests is that the arts may have supported mental health and well-being during this time. And we're currently working with Arts Council England um, to expand on this work to understand in greater detail the implications of these findings. So already partnership working is essential there. Now the WHO report also puts forward a number of policy recommendations based on the evidence as shown on the screen here. But I think the most important of these to our discussion today is to note the cross-sectoral nature of arts and health, suggesting that we need to create structures for cross-sectoral collaboration, develop stronger lines of referral from health and social care to community arts organizations, and include arts and humanities in the training of healthcare professionals. We're also further exploring policy recommendations based on our research on the arts and COVID and our work with Arts Council England, as I noted, and we're trying to explore whether we need to understand um, we, how we can improve access for the new audiences that have um, engaged with the arts during the pandemic and explore further the opportunities and barriers that digital platforms may offer for arts interventions. So one way that we can seek to meet these recommendations is to develop partnerships, such as bringing together those working within research policy and practice. Um, as Stephen Weiber noted earlier, partnerships can unlock things. And we're trying to um, build on our partnership working to um, enable this kind of unlocking in our current work at UCL. So one way that we've been building partnerships is through our March network funded by UK Research and Innovation. This is a network of over 1,800 people from social, cultural and community organizations and representatives of clinical commissioning groups as well as policy organizations. So we've been working with policy bodies such as the WHO and the Arts Council, as I mentioned, and we also co-produced a research agenda working with academics from a range of different disciplines, which is important to have interdisciplinarity at the heart of what we're doing and working together with community organizations and individuals, as well as other research and public engagement bodies. We're also currently collaborating with WHO Europe to improve the implementation of effective and sustainable arts and health interventions. So not only has it been important to us to understand the efficacy of interventions, but also to think about how we can scale up these interventions to different populations. Funded by the Nordic Culture Fund, we're collaborating with arts and policy organizations across Finland, Belgium, Denmark, Romania, and the UK to identify and scale up interventions with a strong evidence base. So we're starting this work by implementing a group singing intervention in both Denmark and Romania to support new mothers experiencing low mood, founded upon previous evidence that has shown singing to significantly reduce symptoms of postnatal depression and lead to a faster recovery. We're working with experts from Breathe Arts Health Research, an organization in the UK who lead a groundbreaking singing service called Melody for Mums. And I would urge you to go to their website if you don't know about this program because it's a really exciting initiative. And through our multiple partners across Europe, we want to tailor this intervention to local contexts and identify good practices for rolling out evidence-based interventions in other countries in the future, working to optimize and improve healthcare delivery through arts and culture. So this is just a brief snapshot of the collaborative work that we're doing, but it highlights how partnerships are foundational in the replication, scalability and sustainability of these effective arts interventions. And I very much look forward to discussing with you all further throughout the rest of this event, how we can work to improve these structures for cross-sectoral collaboration. Thank you very much. Thank you, Katie. Um, it's truly um, enlightening how um, a, an example of um, a, a research organization um, using partnering um, as a sustainable, replicable um, tool, let's say, um, for actually achieving sustainable development. Um, also partnering across different countries um, and different um, kinds of stakeholders. Um, and this is um, all very interesting to, to learn about. And I, there are so many people in the attendees who are actually uh, asking questions. And I'm, I'm sure you will have some follow up after. Uh, thank you for being with us. Uh, now we have, um, unfortunately, a little bit less time than we were hoping for, uh, for a general Q&A. Um, we will also have some uh, closing remarks by Stephen at the end of it all. Um, but uh, perhaps we could go a little bit over time, maybe five to 10 minutes after half past um, because we have quite a few questions, um, seven in the um, Q&A box, um, we might have even more. Um, I will refer to Juliana uh, who has been um, collating them I, um, I believe and perhaps Juliana you can um, uh, 
point the way forward for us to um, see what kind of questions have been asked and uh, we'll try to answer at least some of them. Uh, what do you say? Thank you, Ege, and thank you for all those uh, incredible uh, presentations and the, and the importance of partnerships uh, to achieve a sustainable future. Uh, I ordered the, um, uh, the questions uh, into priority as the likes they got, uh, so they can be relevant to the public. And uh, I start with uh, a question about practical tools to measure the quantitative contribution of culture, heritage, and art to the resiliency beyond the economic contributions. So um, a question on quant quantitative methods uh, to go beyond economic contributions. Um, well, uh, let's see, um, is, is this uh, addressed to all uh, speakers in general? It was addressed to all. Okay, well, uh, let's ask if there's anybody who would like to volunteer to um, start responding to this question among our panelists. If not, I will have to pick someone, sorry. Oh, Katie, thank you. Please go ahead. I'm happy to make a few reflections on that. Um, at our work at, at UCL, we certainly use a wide range of different methods, but quantitative methods are one of the methods that we use. Um, one of the things that we do is work with cohort study data. So this is following people across the lifespan um, and exploring thousands of different individuals on their behaviors and looking at arts and cultural behaviors and how that might impact upon health and well-being across the lifespan. So this is obviously moving well beyond economic outcomes um, and thinking about how it improves well-being, different aspects of quality of life, social relationships and meaning and value um, through large scale quantitative analyses. Um, so that's just one example of the kind of work that we're doing. And um, we're also doing quantitative work through the COVID social study that I mentioned. Again, looking at things beyond economic outcomes, um, exploring health and well-being and life satisfaction, for example. Um, we certainly do consider economic um, outcomes in, in that data as well. So um, thinking about how um, health and well-being um, outcomes may be cost saving for the NHS, how the arts may be able to provide cost saving avenues um, for the NHS. We also do um, intervention studies um, where we use quantitative me measures such as surveys to explore different dimensions of health and well-being. So this might be, for example, um, in a singing study, we would um, collect different, a, a wide range of different measures to understand how that singing intervention may impact upon health and well-being. So I do think there's a wide range of different ways to quantitatively measure well beyond um, economic um, outcomes. Thank you. I can't help but follow up with a little mini question on that. Uh, you're talking about measuring well-being throughout the lifespan of your samples, but actually, how do you quantify well-being? I mean, uh, maybe we're curious about the actual quantitative criteria. Um, is, is it a yes-no question or how does it work? And yeah, the, so there are different um, validated psychological scales that have been used many times across many studies um, to see whether this is actually in fact measuring what we set out to measure, in this case, well-being. So one of the famous ones is the um, Warwick Edinburgh Mental Wellbeing Scale, which is commonly used in a wide range of different studies and often used in arts-based intervention studies. All right, great. Um, we need to follow up on that. Uh, thank you very much. So. Um, that question seems to be uh, checked more or less, unless there is a burning um, request to add something. I don't see any. Um, any other questions that we could address right now, Juliana? Yes, we have a very interesting question to both ECOMOS and maybe the Climate Heritage Network uh, on the contribution of the World Heritage Convention to uh, the ecological transition and how to integrate this into Article 5, the one that gives a function to heritage to the local communities and implementation integration on the, on, on the, uh, on the planning programs. That sounds like Patricia could be a good uh, respondent uh, because she's both ECOMOS and also uh, dealing with um, our World Heritage. The World Heritage Convention is something that at the core of our work and um, Patricia is also very much involved in landscapes, uh, which brings culture, nature, ecology together. Are you there? Perhaps Patricia, you could... Um, sure. Yes, I think I think this is a really complicated and interesting question. It deserves a long answer, but I'll give a short one which essentially is um, that in the heritage sector, we often think about materiality and we have to think about the intangible aspects of heritage. And these days we also have to think about the climate issues, resiliency issues, recovery, 
in a best way from the pandemic. So I would suggest that um, the field of heritage needs to look to the future with greater flexibility and that we must be able to adapt our culture to ecology and to embrace and perhaps reposition humanity as dependent upon and integrated with the planet. Mm -hmm. Right, thank you. Um, I'm not sure if Pamela um, is um, still available to provide more of an ECOMOS perspective, but I think you, Juliana mentioned the Climate Heritage Network as someone um, uh, um, that the questions was directed to. So maybe Julie, uh, would you like to say a few words on that also? Yes, I agree. And I think nature-based solutions absolutely include the integration of cultural heritage in, in ways about not just the loss of the physicality, but what, what is the loss to humans of resources um, in larger landscapes. And so that, that integration of, of, of nature and culture and, and, and these kinds of solutions to help with climate action is really something that we're looking on in a more holistic landscape with communities, both adjacent communities and indigenous communities to provide solutions that, that, are really, um, that really do look at the health of both nature and humans in, in the solutions that we, we, we need for greater climate ambition. So I don't, I think that in the, the work that we're doing, we're really hearkening back and, and looking to that holistic landscape solution rather than on an issue by issue basis for greater achievement. Mm -hmm. Right, thank you. Um, I think I'll also ask Pamela if she's um, able to um, add um, to these points. Well, I think uh, one of the things that we've, we've done in ECOMOS is the whole nature culture journey. Uh, which we were very involved with a few years ago that involved our, our sister organization, IUCN, um, who's also one of the statutory advisory bodies to the World Heritage Convention. And at e ECOMOS, we, we look at cultural sites that are um, not only just about culture, but also about nature integrated together. So cultural landscapes is very much an area that we explore. Um, obviously, if we haven't figured out how to, um, to live on this planet in an equitable fashion, where we're not just constantly consuming resources, we're gonna be in big trouble. So we, we need to do better at this than we have been as a humanity, as a, as the human race and to make room for animals to continue to exist and fish, etc. cetera. Um, you know, it's a, it's a big, big area to mm -hmm. contemplate. And um, ECOMOS is trying to do our part. Mm -hmm. Right, of course. Um, the culture nature connection, um, in, it's also a big cultural issue how we look at our environment um, and the resource um, consumption and degradation as well. Um, but there was also a special focus in the question on the World Heritage. And uh, we could perhaps remind everybody that the World Heritage Convention is the first UN convention that addresses culture and nature together. So there's great potential in actually using World Heritage as such a medium. Um, I think uh, what you said also um, validates that. Um, if there's nobody else from the panelists who would like to contribute to this question, um, let's see. Can you raise hands? Uh, I don't see any. I think we can move on to uh, maybe a final third question, um, Juliana, um, and then we move to the concluding remarks. You can always write to us for uh, further answers if you, your questions haven't really been um, fully answered today. Apologies because of the lack of time. Um, but the, we can do another verbal response to a question um, as you choose, Juliana. Again, we have two uh, very short and very relevant questions that maybe we have the time to address. The first one would be uh, about uh, using language, local languages uh, and minorities through uh, uh, through the the way to to recovery. This would be the first uh, the the first point. The second point uh, would be how to uh, integrate minorities as a political tool. So from the political point of view uh, to, uh, to uh, a more uh, sustainable uh, uh, building back better. 
Mm -hmm. um, I see Doris has her hand up, please. Uh, yes, thank you. I'm uh, very happy to hear that question. Um, I, I want to share one um, example of, of how to ground that question with a good answer that we heard at the Renaissance Now launch. It came from um, Irena Grykova, uh, who told us about a, a language program in Reggio Emilia, because there were so many Arabic speaking immigrants, uh, the city decided it would give Arabic lessons to Italian kids in the high school. So there's a way of using um, immigrant populations as an opportunity to make cosmopolitan citizens from native uh, populations and really see immigration as an advantage. Uh, one thing that we do with pretext is um, play with a target text in home languages. So if German kids in Mannheim need to, if, uh, if uh, uh, Arabic speaking or Turkish speaking or other African uh, speaking um, children uh, need to be integrated into German speaking schools, why not play with a German text in a home language? You can work out a choreography, you can work out a, a pantomime routine, but the German text is your target text and playing in your home language with a target language uh, is permissible. We, we haven't really considered the advantages of multilingualism intellectually, um, but uh, people who have experience with multilingualism know that uh, framing the world in more than one grammar and more than one uh, vocabulary uh, is enabling, it's not disabling. Uh, so this is a great opportunity to rethink what citizenship is uh, and to take multilingual environments as um, advantages. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. Um, if I may take the liberty, Doris, of uh, when you said citizenship and cosmopolitanism, um, I want, and we're talking about Mannheim and German, um, I wonder how, if you could connect this to Gemeinschaft versus Gesellschaft, you know, communities and societies. So we're right. evolving among these. Right. What well, the modern, the modern language for that difference is uh, bonding and bridging, right? Uh, there's one way to think about culture and society as uh, making us more coherent. And that's one of the dangers of thinking about culture as uh, a, uh, just the legacy, the tight package. But if you think about bridging, then different cultures become ad uh, advantages to creative processes of interpreting, of, uh, uh, of being um, free uh, to improvise uh, new combinations. So uh, that, uh, that traditional sociological difference is very important today, as I say, as an opportunity to think of bridging rather than bonding. And still heritage is super important. Uh, the question is, how to use it? Right. Thank you so much. Um, I wish we had more time for more conversations. Just It seems like it's just starting. Maybe there will be further coffee break conversations after the event among attendees. Um, but uh, I think now um, we need to um, move on to the last segment where Stephen um, has the great job of <laughs> wrapping up with a few concluding remarks based on all this amazing content. Here you go, Stephen, good luck. Thank you. And, and thank you in particular to you, Ege, for moderating this whole session so well. It's, it's, for me, you know, it, it felt incredibly dynamic. We've had such a great range of speakers, of course, contributing perspectives, contributing insights. And I think it's also been interesting that really this has been a coming together of the development community and the cultural arts and heritage community, which in the end is what we're looking to do with partnerships. So I suppose I wrote down a few points for myself as a sort of summing up points. I think the first thing I wanted to say was, I think we covered all but one of the SDGs during this session. We didn't name them by numbers and we don't expect everyone to know their SDGs off by heart from one to 17. But just reflecting on the issues we covered, all of them, I think the one we didn't cover was energy, but maybe I just missed that one. So we really talked about issues, we really talked about actions that are delivering progress across the goal, goals through partnerships involving cultures. So firstly, that threat coverage. There's also partnerships between issues. We've covered this a few times, but the fact that there is this really strong link that cultural arts and heritage are not additional, they're not optional, they're not a silo somewhere else. 
They really are such a basis of creativity. They're therefore a basis for innovation. And as Geordie mentioned, they're a basis for science. And so simply trying to look at them isolated on their own doesn't make sense. We have not just partnerships between ourselves, but also partnerships between issues, these interconnections that are such a key part of the SDGs. Culture is right up there. I heard a few times people talking about the need to innovate ourselves, to build new partnerships ourselves, to be ready not just to sit there and wait and expect people to come to us and to come and try and to call on us, knock on the door saying, that, what can we do? We also need to take that spirit of the Renaissance that Doris mentioned, the, the willingness obviously to be humble, except that we can't do everything, to not sort of go out there and demand respect and say we're fantastic all the time, but also to be ambitious, to think, well, how can we contribute to different ways of doing things? So within the field, how can we mobilize those superpowers? How can we think about, how can, how can we think about how we can contribute the impact that we're having and some of the, the different ways of measuring, the different approaches that, for example, Katie was talking about, offer some really interesting ways of rethinking how cultural actors can contribute and looking a bit more broadly. Of course, to make this all happen, the right conditions are essential. And it was fantastic to have Mayor Sawyer and Mayor Kurtz here at the beginning, who are such fantastic examples of a local government providing the tent, the catalyst, the incubator, the space, the facilitator, the enzyme even that allows these partnerships to work. The enzyme, it's a fantastic, it's a lovely metaphor, the, the thing that connects, that brings together actors, that brings together people, that actually allows that reaction to happen. And also having those local governments that are willing to, to innovate, to be entrepreneurial. It's culture, as again, going back to what Doris was saying about the spirit of the Renaissance, to be ambitious, to be a little bit entrepreneurial, to take risks, and to have local governments in particular who see so directly the impacts of effective engagement of culture, to have those local governments that are actually really supporting progress. And clearly in doing this, having governments at all levels that make culture fundamental, that see, that understand that culture should be as fundamental to policy making as it is to the societies for which policy is made. Um, I shouldn't, I can't not mention COVID. Um, it's been mentioned a few times. I don't know, sadly, obviously, we're still talking about it. We're going to continue to talk about it some time to come. But certainly what Katie said, the examples about underlining this big increase in the demand for cultural engagement, its demand for cultural participation. Yet unavoidably, we're also in a situation where just as demand is rising, we're seeing the capacity of the sector to respond in many cases, undermine the risk of the foundations being washed away. And so this need to think, to act now, and we are at a time that the radical is normal, that completely unthinkable change is unprecedented. We use the word unprecedented far too much, but unprecedented change is things we really don't, we couldn't have anticipated before become normal. Can we apply some of that readiness to deal with the radical, to take the radical in our stride, to actually then think, well, can we make that change? Can we support, make sure the cultural sector is contributing now, that it continues to be able to contribute in the future? And of course, that it is at the heart of partnerships in order to deliver on development. So I think those are the points I had down. Back to you, Eke. Okay. Great, great stuff. Thank you so much. And um, your points about um, a new normal, really, an unprecedented time. And uh, I think the cultural sector is ready for unprecedented and bold and innovative moves um, to actually contribute our full potential through partnerships, of course. So many, many thanks uh, for this um, uh, well-rounded uh, roundup for us. And also many thanks to Juliana for um, the very good curation of the questions. Um, so now it's my job just to say, um, we are so appreciative of this great high attendance um, and the patience of even our mayors are still here. That's uh, quite, quite flattering, actually. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, well, we will follow up on all this information. The, our task is continuing. Uh, so I hope to see you around um, in other projects and partnerships and have a wonderful day or evening, everybody. Take care and um, goodbye. Bye, everyone. Thank you for.